Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It is the 20th of September and it's a pretty quiet week because next week is Ignite and I think all of the product groups are saving up all their big announcements. But there's still a couple of things we can quickly cover. As always, please like, subscribe, comment and share if this is useful. So new videos this week, I posted part two of my Azure Masterclass. This was identity. This follows on from the kind of the foundations we covered the previous week. It is an hour 45 long. So there's a lot of stuff in there. And after this video, I'm about to go and record part three, which is governance. I also posted kind of a 20 minute video. A lot of people asking about, well, how can I create my own presentations? Any tips? So I created this kind of my top tips for presenting um, might be useful. Don't forget Microsoft Ignite is next week. You can still go and register. It is free, tons of technical sessions. There's the URL to go and register and next week. So get in there. This is your last chance. Bunch of stuff around storage um, this week. Firstly, for Azure Files, NFS 4.1 in public preview. So you can go and register for NFS in your subscription. And then for a premium Azure Files type storage account, so it has to be a files type storage account, not general purpose and premium tier. Then when I go and create shares, I can actually go and create it of type NFS. If I was to quickly kind of jump over and look, here I've got a premium file share type storage account. And now if I go and add a file share, I get this SMB or NFS option kind of down here at the bottom. Um, I can do root squash or no root squash. This is really a Linux thing. All about if I'm connecting with a root account, instead of having kind of those root access privileges, it kind of sets me to a no NFS nobody. So it's a kind of a security mechanism. So I can pick whether or not to use that. But now I can go ahead, a share is SMB or NFS. I cannot do kind of dual protocol on the same share I pick. It has the full mandatory set of capabilities. It's POSIX compatible, but at the public preview time, there is no uh, encryption in transit. It is encrypted at rest, but no encryption at transit. No AD integration for kind of the ACLs, but it can do UID, GID. Then we get Azure NetApp files. So again, another thing around sort of file type protocols. This does support multi-protocol shares. So on a single NetApp file share, I can have both SMB and NFS access. That's pretty cool capability. They've also added support for now over the wire in transit encryption. Now this is based around Kerberos. So what that means is, my Linux client, or whatever client I'm using, has to be able to talk to domain controllers, Active Directory domain controllers. Also, my Linux machines have to have an object in that Active Directory to enable that kind of secure authentication to the Kerberos service, so we can actually go and get the um, secrets, etc., required for that encryption. So there's actually going to be kind of this add-on. There's an NFS set of utils. It's going to use the KRB5 um, encryption. There's a few steps to perform. But now once you've done this, I'll actually get over the wire encryption. Now, I would remind you of one thing around this. Remember the way NetApp files works, Azure NetApp files, is when I create volumes, those volumes actually go into a delegated subnet. So if I think about regular Azure, if I think about, hey, look, I've got my VNet. The way Azure NetApp files, I've got my Azure NetApp files over here. And I can think about, well, I have my account, I have a capacity pool, then I have a volume. When I create that volume, the volume actually gets mapped into a delegated subnet. So it's actually in your VNet. And that's for a particular volume. So then anything else in kind of that virtual network will just be kind of talking to something in that VNet. 
So it is a kind of boundary anyway of network communications. So whether you need that over the wire encryption or not, um, it's going to depend. Now, obviously, if I'm doing other connections into that VNet, express route, site site VPN, it may become a bigger deal. But just remember the fact that the way Azure NetApp Files works is it actually basically projects into your virtual network through that delegated subnet. So the decision whether or not I actually need the over the wire is probably going to vary by customer. But it's there. Also now cross-region replication is available. Now the way this works is if you think about Azure NetApp files, it's actually physical stamps of kind of the NetApp filers in different regions. And what they're doing is the pairing is actually done at a physical hardware level. So East US to Central or whatever, they're setting up the physical pairings for the NetApp file, filers that power your accounts capacity pools and ultimately the volumes. So what I can now do is at the volume level, I can pick replication. Now it is a kind of one-to-one, -one. I can have one replica, I can't replicate a replica. And I have to align with where they have set up those physical pairings between the NetApp files in the various regions. Now when I do this cross-region replication, I can pick the replication interval. Um, again, on a volume basis, 10 minutes, an hour, once a day, whatever I need for that. Now, this does not map to the regular storage account pairings. Regular storage accounts have kind of a single pair. That is not the case here. They have set up their own pairings between the various NetApp filers. We can actually go to the article where it walks through all the regional pairings. So I can see west to east, west two to east south central i can see to east so there's more pairings than we would get with a regular storage account and what i've been told is if you need a different pairing that is not one of those ones that's there already you can actually kind of go ahead and talk to netat and they will see what they can do about getting those physical connections those physical pairings in place between the filers in the various regions um, Azure Blob Access Time and Access Time Based Lifecycle Management. So this is all around the fact that I have an attribute normally for blobs, kind of the last modified time. What this is doing is adding another attribute, last access time. So if I just go ahead and read the blob, it will update that access time. Now why we care about that is lifecycle management. If we think about what lifecycle management is, it's all about the idea that, well, I can have these different tiers. I can have kind of a hot tier, I can have a cool tier, and I can have an archive tier. And what we can do with kind of the lifecycle management is I can set rules to say, hey, um, ordinarily, if it's not been modified for 30 days, move it from hot to cool. If it's not been modified for 60 days, move it from cool to archive. So it was all based around the modify date. With this new capability, well now I can actually do it based on access time. So hey, if it's been accessed in the last 60 days, don't move it to archive, keep it in call. So this is all based around those lifecycle policies. So if I go and just look at a regular storage account, now I don't have it, it's in, only in certain regions right now, it's like Canada and France, I think. But if I ordinarily just go and look at lifecycle management and I add a rule, we can see, well, look, I can pick blob and now I've got append blobs as well, which is super cool. But I would give it kind of a name. And what we'll see is, notice it's last modified. So all I get right now when I go and look at the rule because I'm not part of this kind of um, capability is all I have available to me is last modified. Now, with this new capability, I would also see an option of last access. So it's going to give me kind of an enhanced set of capabilities around there. So that's what that is all about. Now we're going to have an access time that's updated every time the blob is read. And I can use that now in my lifecycle management policies. Miscellaneous. The new architecture exams, 303, 304, have gone live. So they've now retired the old ones. If you took the beta exam within the next 10 days, you should find out your result. And also PL100, the Power Platform App Maker, is live as well.
So those exams, you can now go and take them, get instant results. There's also now a retail pricing API endpoint in preview. This is all about, hey look, I wanna work out how much something's going to cost. Today, I can use the Azure pricing calculator, I can use the portal. With this, it's, it's, I don't have to authenticate to this endpoint. With this just non-authenticated endpoint, I can now programmatically go and hook in and get the pricing for kind of the retail SKUs and work out what my cost will be. And that's it. Uh, that's this week's updates. As always, um, please go ahead and comment below. Until next week, take care.